Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 41st Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I am the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time this morning, and welcome to all our regular attendees. I'm just going to quickly run through a couple of housekeeping slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, for anybody joining us for the first time, uh, typical companies you'll see presenting on here are capped under 300 million. They are in revenue, generally approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We don't have companies from the resources and the biotechnology sector. So we have what I call industrial microcaps, which is a catch-all term for microcap technology names, microcap healthcare, um, microcap retailing, financial services, um, hardcore industrial products businesses or industrial services businesses. Uh, generally, we run these every fortnight, although more recently we've been running them every week. And uh, two companies present over the space of the hour, each company getting a 30 minute slot, which we generally break down into a 20 minute presentation from the company and then we throw it open for 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you do have any questions for our presenters this morning, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box function. Uh, it just makes it much easier for me to moderate the questions at the end. And um, please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, where you can follow Coffee Microcaps, you can guess on Twitter, as I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and indeed the previous uh, other 40 um, Coffee Microcaps morning meetings we've had in this series so long, LinkedIn, and I also write a weekly paid subscription newsletter where I profile one interesting microcap stock every week, and you can get that on the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, up first, we're gonna have uh, Mr. Glenn Smith, the MD from Tally Digital. After that, then uh, returning to give us an update, actually, we have Brad O'Connor, the CEO of Cogstate. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Glenn, who I know is waiting patiently to kick off. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, hopefully everyone can see my full screen now. Um, um, Don, sorry, Glenn. It's... Uh, Coming up all black on my side. I'm not sure what's happening on your side. Maybe just try resharing it again. Okay, that will do. Okay, there we go. Looking good now, Glenn. Looking good. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Glenn Smith from Tali Digital Limited. Uh, our ticker code on the ASX is TD1. I'm just going to speak to you today about an area you may be unfamiliar with, but we're in the area of digital therapeutics and what we really like to generally call software as a medical treatment. We're at the intersect of science and clinical research and then applying technology and, and apps to deliver out really consumer friendly and, and healthcare friendly digital applications. So, what have we achieved and, and where are we going at the moment? One of the core aspects of Tali is that we have a patented technology platform and that platform uh, allows us to build over the top of it applications and they're gamified applications that allow children to begin with as our first target market, but eventually adults to come into a gamified digital therapeutic world and that delivers out um, their therapy and clinical outcomes to those patients. So we've patented in the US, Japan, Australia and other PCT pending. Um, all our work is clinically validated and we have regulatory clearance. So think of us as a tech company that also leverages like a pharmaceutical company. We do randomised controlled trials and move through the regulatory pathway and we're FDA class two in the US, TGA in Australia and C marked. We work on a direct to uh, patient and also partnership model. And we have partnerships globally with key institutions like Duke University in US, uh, the Times Group in India for our uh, commercial rollout and other key customer partnerships in Singapore 
And I'll talk about other partnerships we're likely to execute in the US. We're revenue ready, we're generating uh, revenue through a B2B healthcare model in Australia, and we've just secured a $7 million US dollar investment from uh, the Times Group in India to help us commercially roll out our, our products into the Indian environment. So where are we targeting first? We're really looking at this whole area of attention deficits and in children, particularly those children between the ages of three to eight, which is a massive global issue. About 136 million children globally have a clinical diagnosis of attention deficits. There's a huge cost burden on the healthcare and general economy um, with ADHD treatment uh, projected to be 24.9 billion by 2025. So only four years away. And there's a significant treatment market there for us to attack. We're looking at those early childhood segments where the brain is at its most plastic. So this whole area of neuroplasticity, where you can make uh, direct interventions and changes to the neural connections and pathways and that cognitive development of the child. That brings significant healthcare and social wellbeing outcomes, and that delivers healthcare efficiencies and value returns to the economy generally, and allows technology solutions to take a piece of the healthcare spending pie while reducing the overall cost burden to governments and insurers, which is a key, key critical area moving forward of delivering value in that healthcare system. Our, our technology is a scalable technology solution. Not only do we test, but we also treat this area of inattention and attention, attention deficits through digital means. Um, and so those digital solutions are there to basically, to assess and improve that early attention during childhood. So what does it look like to a patient, a child? Well, it looks like a gamified tool, just like any other application that a child or parent or healthcare professional may download from the iOS store or the Google Play store. These type of digital interventions are non-invasive, non-threatening, but deliver out um, certified and regulated testing and treatment therapy to the child. So the child doesn't know they're being treated. Um, they get a much more compliant, um, compliant therapy regime and there's much more value delivered because the delivery of a digital technology is at much lower cost than in clinic. So there's a whole lot of benefits to the healthcare sector generally. We deliver out our two products at the moment. The first two on your left-hand side of the screen are Tali Detect, which is a 20 minute test. And that, that tests the inattention or attention deficit probability of the child. It produces a report very similar to a report you might get from a, a blood work report. It gives you a whole lot of data, it tells both the parent and clinician where the child sits and what the intervention pathway should be. And then they move on to our Tali train, which is the actual therapy regime. And that's delivered firstly in a short, sharp burst of five weeks, but can be delivered over the long term of 12 to 24 months, which is our Tali maintained part of the program. Crucially, because it's a technology solution, access to these type of regulated products can be from the app stores. And you'll see on the right hand side of your screen that you simply download these applications from the app store, get a unique code through your healthcare provider or directly from Tali, and then you move through the program from there. For a healthcare professional and others working with the child or the patient, um, it's, a, it's a healthcare model. They get all the data in real time. They get a whole set of reports. They get their own clinical portal. It can integrate with their current practice management systems. And they can produce a whole brain um, overlay set on a child. So they can repeat the tests and see how the child's brain or cognitive function is progressing over their journey. We, as I said earlier, do all this on the basis of science and evidence. And these um, next couple of slides are just two of our randomized controlled trials or a published research work. We have eight published research papers at the moment. We'll double that in the next two years. And all this is about validity and significance of our test and also our therapy. In this slide, you're seeing our Tali Detect test and how it measures up against current clinical testing regimes. And what you'll see from the green data on the right is that it's acceptable or better than the current 
standard. So what we're trying to do is exceed current standard and then eventually make Tali detect the new gold standard in testing for attention deficits. The same here for Tali train. What you're seeing here in the graphic is that over and above the control that was used in the research trial, Tali train has a significant gain in selection attention accuracy. And in general terms, that means if you do Tali train and do it over the five week period, as against other type of like for like products in the market, three months after you do it, there's a sustained increasing benefit from Tali train. And that tells you that Tali train is delivering a cognitive change in that child. So there is performance improvement and change in that, in that cognitive function of that child. So these are significant findings and we'll continue to overlay these significant findings um, during the next few years. But these findings allow us to build these technology solutions and deliver them to clinical pathways, but also direct to parents as well. So let's talk about that commercial model and, and the rollout strategy. Now, this is the unique thing about digital testing and digital therapeutics is that because they're gamified applications and they can be accessed through app stores, we have the unique ability to use different type of delivery models. We can go B2B, so healthcare or schools, or B2C, so direct to parents. Our primary delivery model at the moment is the centre, the healthcare providers. They're the ones who own the patients currently and already have those patients on their books. So they're a high value target for us to deliver out these solutions. But in markets with less sophisticated healthcare infrastructure, we can go direct to parents and schools. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to our Times Group of India deal in the next few slides. But what does that mean for us as a company and, and generating revenue and really profitability? Well, what we're doing in the US is following an international partner and licensing model. And we're just in finalization of a partner and license agreement for the US. Um, and our particular products of Tali Detect and Tali Train already fall under current reimbursement codes in the US. So once we finalize that agreement, the products will be able to be rolled out and delivered under current reimbursement models. And we're also looking to expand those reimbursement codes in the US. In India, we're doing something slightly different. We have a partner model, but that's with the Times Group in India. And we're launching direct to consumers and a B2B, a B2G, so a business to government model. And that's because governments control the fund flow to schools and education. And India has a very well-funded and sophisticated education system. And we can deliver out our solutions, not only directly to the parent, but also into the school sector there. We're also working really closely with potential partners in Japan to follow the similar type of model we're going to execute on in the US. And that's a partner and licensing agreement model where Japan is a highly regulated and sophisticated model for attention deficits. It's a very high margin, high profitability um, country for our type of uh, technology solutions. And we'll continue to um, push the potential partners to finalization of agreements there. And the UK is a really, um, really high value market for us over the medium to long term. Think of the UK as the world oldest insurance scheme. The National Health Service there is a, is a whole, whole population wide insurance scheme. Uh, Tali can fit into that insurance scheme. We have a similar quarantine insurance scheme here in Australia called the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Tali already fits in under the NDIS and is fully reimbursed under the NDIS. We'll be following a similar model in the UK. In our view over the medium to long term for our digital therapeutics is that the UK through the National Health Service will be a very high margin um, geographic region for our solutions. Well, let's just quickly touch on the Times Group because it's top of mind in what we're doing in our rollout in uh, the subcontinent and, and looking at other potential partners in Asia as well. The Times Group is the largest media conglomerate in Southeast Asia. Um, they have invested US $7 million directly into Tali Digital Limited, so TD1. And that money really to begin with is to assist with marketing and advertising rollout direct to parents. 
but so we've taken the first US 2 million of that. The subsequent 5 million will be really around expanding to that government and education sector. So it's a very large growing market. There are an estimated you know, US 7 to 800 million um, users in that market, a very large um, smartphone utilization rate. Our products are delivered through smartphone, um, a high app utilization rate in the India market and a real high propensity to spend in the middle class in India on tools that um, assist their child's focus and learning outcomes. So we know what the value per client is in India because those middle class, um, no, that middle class in India is owned by the Times Group through their subscription model. So we have all the data on that middle class and we know what they're spending currently on educational and health tools and we know what margin we can extract out of that India market. But also there's a high ability for our products to have a massive impact on children in India because of the underlying attention deficits there. So that ability to impact um, really at a health and education level will drive profitability for our business. Again, you know, they are market leading in India. They own assets countrywide through TV, print, digital and radio. Um, effectively, uh, the, the, they are the largest media conglomerate there uh, and touch at least 90% of the entire um, Indian population, both through in English and other dialects in India. So they're an amazing partner for us and they assist with all the uh, marketing and advertising assets and, and content creation. And all that is done at no cost to us through our partnership model with Brand Capital. So we have really high expectations over the medium to long term for that Indian market. We've got a proven leader set here from our chair, Sue McLeeman, uh, Jefferson Harcourt and Dr. David Brooks, a wide range of commercialization, healthcare and international expansion experience. And internally, we have a core group of management and team who experienced in not only healthcare delivery models, but game development, app development, and commercialization of products through global partnership networks. I want to just touch on um, where we will go and, and much more of the blue sky for a company like Tali. We're focused on this early childhood segment now in this three to eight, and we have products that we're delivering out in that segment. And they're going to deliver us um, significant value in the near term. But because our technology platform isn't age specific and our patents aren't age specific, we can start to gamify our algorithms and technology platform for adults and later stage populations. And we're going to start a clinical trial in the US with significant institutions there out of Texas um, in a few months, where we're going to test the feasibility of Tali being delivered to older populations to slow the progression of mild cognitive impairment, or in other words, slow the progression of cognitive decline, such as dementia. So that's a significant opportunity for us where we can overlay our technology into different applications and service different markets. We know there's a significant opportunity, both at a healthcare and wellbeing level to enter that mild cognitive impairment space. We know the funding that's in that segment through governments and other, other insurance schemes. And if we can prove that Tali has benefit in those populations, then there's a significant blue sky opportunity for our technology platform. The benefit of a tech company like ours is our patent portfolio, our algorithmic platform, and the ability to scale quickly into other segments and, and novel populations where we can deliver out longer term value to all our stakeholders, both at a healthcare benefit level for the patient, but a value return for shareholders as well. So that really comes to our focal points for 2021 and 2022. Our near term focal points are really consolidating a partnership in the US in terms of a partner and licensing model there, and really looking to then cement that with additional partnership and licensing agreements in Asia. We're going to allocate more resources to our regulatory and reimbursement strategies so that when Tali enters markets, um, it has codes to enter those market widths or we're actually submitting um, to apply for reimbursement codes. 
We're going to scale up our R&D program, as I just talked about, in those other later stage clinical populations or novel populations to see if Tali has benefit there. And again, you know, we're really on this um, global rollout scalable model where we're really looking at co-development partnerships and cor corporate partnerships at the insurance and healthcare delivery level so that we're integrated, we're a, we're a fulcrum in the ecosystem of new digital therapeutics so that we're locked in over a multi-decade period to be the core piece of technology at the center of these digital therapeutics, particularly in the cognitive function and brain health space. So we'll continue to build on our R&D partnerships and clinical trials as well. So that's it from me. Um, we're Tali, um, ASX TD1, and, and we're here to begin with to create happier kids. Um, and if you'd like any further information on us, please contact us. Back to you, Mark. Thanks, Lynn. And um, we've got one question here in already, so let me tackle that one. Um, at the moment, Tally is only registered with the FDA for assessment, not treatment. Uh, the, it's kind of a two-part question. How about the status in other geographies? Uh, is it a, proved to be a treating tool anywhere? And what's the pathway to get uh, treatment device approval? Yeah, it's a good question. So in the US, the classification is actually for a cognitive performance and training tool. Um, so you're correct, it's not um, technically treatment, but it is for a cognitive performance test and, tr and training tool. So in Australia, it's classed, Tully Train is actually classed as a, as a training intervention to deliver out um, therapy to a particular population on the TDA, TGA class one. Um, in other jurisdictions, we would have to apply um, for a specific treatment regulatory clearance. Um, we're looking at that, particularly for markets such as Japan and increasing our regulatory clearance in the USA. And we're looking at that specifically for um, patients who have a clinical diagnosis of ADHD. So we would target just a single population, such as an ADHD population, ADHD population and either increase our regulatory clearance in the US to be an actual treatment for ADHD populations and the same for Japan. So we have a plan in place, we have partners in place to do that um, and we have clear visibility on how to do that and high, high confidence that we can deliver that over the forward period in the next 12 to 24 months. Yeah, great. Uh, questions are flying in here now, Glenn. So we, let's see how many we can get done in the time. Uh, I, next question. I understand the global opportunity, but why not prove out the product in Australia, which could provide uh, credibility globally? So I guess, uh, I mean, why not get it really up and running in Australia and then go global? Yeah, it's obviously um, a piece of information and strategy that we have considered um, and we shouldn't be um, dismissive because we have done um, initial validation and market testing in Australia where um, you know, 6,000 customers have, have used the Tali technology either detect or train. So we haven't dismissed that. Um, but one of the key things to remember is that this area of digital therapeutics in particular is much more advanced um, in North America, Europe and Japan than it is in Australia. Uh, both at a regulatory and commercial level. Um, and I think you'll see um, over the coming weeks and months that our model to really focus on uh, international expansion and that partnership licensing model um, will prove uh, really valuable to both patients and shareholders and probably cement um, that strategy in place. We won't forget about Australia, but we have um, we have a bit more of a medium term view of how Tali will be inserted into the clinical model here. And we have a, a planned reimbursement strategy with the Medicare benefit scheme through an MSAC uh, submission in Australia um, over the medium term where Tali can be reimbursed. So there's no guarantee there, but that's our strategy there. But I think, um, I think stakeholders will see the benefit of a, a global first approach by Tali in the coming weeks and months. Okay, and then the next one, uh, within the various markets, do you need to build a vastly different product depending on the region? Or is it more a case of just putting it into kind of local languages? 
Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, one of the things about scaling is that we won't change either the algorithms or the gamified interface. So we will keep that no matter where we go into each of the geographic regions. There's um, already built into Tali a language translation um, code base. So we will optimise um, language for particular jurisdictions such as Japan. We will look at different dialects for India um, and a few other regions, uh, for example, South Korea and, and other markets. But it is simply a language translation or in-market optimization exercise, but certainly no changes to the core technology platform and no changes to the gamified applications. We've done initial testing in India, um, South Korea and a few other markets where our gamified applications have received very high levels of consumer and patient acceptance. So there's no reason to change that. And also because it, it's very critical to maintain the integrity of the program, both yeah, globally, so that we can have um, similar results from, although albeit different um, populations globally, but we can correlate that data and we can also keep some key core marketing messages running through as well, which will be a significant cost saving to the business if we can just keep some um, synergies in our marketing spend as well. Okay, great. And then distribution strategy in the US, do you try to tag along to the school product distributors or is it more into the medical distribution channels? Yeah, I think um, our strategy is um, healthcare. So healthcare first, and then over the medium to long term, there will be not so much leakage, but there'll be uptake in the education sector. And that's because there is um, in Australia and the US and UK and other markets, there are clinical participants in the education sector. So obviously children with attention deficit issues um, go to school, but they have um, you know, a, a network around them, both from teachers and clinical and other support staff. So there will be opportunities to roll out Tali in the education sector, but healthcare is our number one priority at the moment. Okay. A uh, question around the commercial agreement with the Times Group. I know you touched on it in your presentation. Is there perhaps an ASX announcement that um, you know really breaks down the details of that, or or where where would you send somebody if they want uh, a bit more detail on it? Yeah, I think there's quite a significant detailed announcement um, when we announced the agreement back in December 2020, um, which is on the ASX. Um, which has a, a lot of detail around the agreement. If it's, if it's not there, there are obviously other commercial sensitivities as to why we wouldn't release it. But in general, um, the amount invested by the Times Group, how we're going to spend that money, uh, the type of assets we'll use in the Times Group network to um, approach customers, how many customers they have and what type of customers they have. Um, there's a whole lot of detail that we've previously announced. So um, I, I welcome everyone to have a look at that. Um, and if there are any other specific questions, um, you, know, you can send them through to our info or investor email and we can try and answer them for you. Okay, great. And then now one final one from me, from somebody who's got a niece with ADHD. Um, the, the tech part, is that initiated by the parents? You know, they're getting feedback from the child's ECD teachers or if they're slightly older, their primary school teachers, or is it initiated you know, as part of a broader set of tools in a kind of formal clinical assessment where they're doing tally detect on top of three or four other tests to kind of get a confirmation of ADHD and then, you know, how severe it might be within a particular child. Yeah, generally speaking, um, if your child is not already in a healthcare setting, so they don't have a doctor, and they haven't got started that process. For the vast majority of children, it's either the kindergarten teacher, the daycare worker, or the primary school teacher who first notice the cognitive function issue in the child or the behavioral issue in the child. And then they obviously approach the parent. And then from that point on, the parent is activated to either begin the journey to contact Tali, contact Tali, or start to go through a healthcare setting or other type of setting where they get the help they need. So key to what we do is educating and targeting these core groups of people in the early learning sector. 
because they're the ones who spend not the most time, but a significant confined time with your child. And they notice the cognitive function and cognitive development of your child far better than you do yourself. Although you will as a parent, they have um, obviously a benchmark with all other kids in their group and they've got some skill set that allows them to make that type of informed judgment and conversation with the parents. So um, if you're ever in doubt about your child, uh, as a general rule, um, speak to the daycare worker, the kindergarten teacher or the, or the primary school teacher, um, and they'll generally, from their experience, be able to tell you whether or not your child has a, a cognitive function or behavioural issue that you should seek advice on. Okay, Glenn, we're just up on time now, so I think we'll leave it there because I do know Brad, our next presenter, is patiently waiting in the wings. So if you could just please stop sharing your screen. Done. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all. Thanks for your presentation. And then, uh, Brad, if you want to start sharing yours, yeah, I can see it coming now. And if you can just go to, yeah. There we go. You're in full screen mode now, Brad, ready to go. And I'll just unmute myself. That's going to be easier. Thank you, Mark. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Brad O'Connor. I'm Chief Executive of Cogstate. Um, I'll note that there's some um, forward-looking statements in here and no doubt disclaimer. Um, so for those who aren't aware of Cogstate and what we do, um, we're a digital healthcare company. Um, like Lynn was just talking about, also focused around cognition. Um, probably at the other end of the age spectrum, though. Um, so uh, proprietary technology um, uh, designed to measure cognition. Uh, we, we offer that technology and associated services into two main markets. Those markets are clinical trials, where our customers are large pharmaceutical companies um, who are trying to determine whether their therapy or their new drug uh, is impacting the cognition of patients. The other opportunity for us is what we call the healthcare market. And that primarily relates to general practitioner doctors or primary care physicians trying to determine uh, whether their patient is suffering from some sort of cognitive decline. There are some broader thematics that are impacting on our business at the moment in a positive way. Um, the first of which is we've seen the first ever Alzheimer's therapy approved in the United States. And I'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. We have a large and growing market um, for digital healthcare solutions and digital native solutions, which we have. Um, our existing, we have extensive existing relationships with large pharmaceutical companies and we have good visibility in our revenue pipeline going forward. And I'll talk about that through the course of the presentation. Um, in terms of our financial position, Cogstate has a very strong balance sheet. We're uh, profitable financial year 21. We are cash flow positive financial year 21. Um, and uh, a strong balance sheet, $22.5 million US um, of cash, net cash uh, with no debt. Um, so with that, I'm just going to take us through um, at a very high level, the investment case. Um, and I'll come back to that this again at the end of the presentation, um, but just to get everyone thinking about what we're talking about here. So Cogstate presently um, has a record level of revenue um, in, in our pipeline. So over hundred million dollars US, I should state that all numbers I'll talk to today are in US dollars, Cogstate reports in US dollars. Um, so uh, over hundred million dollars US of contracted revenue that we will recognize over coming periods. We have great level of momentum in our clinical trials business. Again, where our customers are large pharmaceutical companies and we have a record level of future revenue there, over $58 million US of revenue that's locked in uh, to roll off in future periods. We've recently executed a partnership with Japanese pharmaceutical company, ASI, um, with respect to the healthcare part of our business. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but that again, provides security in relation to revenue over coming periods. We have a very stable cost base um, and we have good financial leverage through our business and we've transitioned to profit in financial year 21. We have really significant exposure um, to Alzheimer's disease and the Alzheimer's disease treatments that are both been recently approved and also those that are coming onto market 
um, or that we expect to come onto market in, in the coming years. And that provides a, a significant tailwind for our business. We have unique technology um, that's really well validated both commercially um, and scientifically. Um, and, and that opens up to us um, a significant market for digital healthcare assessments, both in the, in the context of um, physician delivered assessments, as well as M health assessments or mobile, mobile self-care assessments. And we really expect that part of our business to grow um, with, in conjunction with our association with our Japanese uh, global partner, ASI. Um, and as I mentioned before, a really strong balance sheet. So um, I've mentioned a couple of times already now this, um, this partnership that we've entered into with, uh, with ASI. So what I want to do now is, because this may be a name that's not familiar to some people. And so this is a little quick background as to who ASI are. They're, they're a global pharmaceutical company. Um, they're ba headquartered in Tokyo, um, but generate revenue worldwide, as you can see, taken from their um, uh, ASI's own um, reporting to investors there, 59.2% uh, of their revenue generated outside of Japan. Um, listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, a market cap in Australian dollars, $31 billion, um, generated revenue last year of uh, $7.7 .7 billion, again, in, in the Australian currency. So um, a substantial um, company um, with a long history in Alzheimer's disease research. In fact, the, the most common symptomatic treatment of Alzheimer's disease, which is called Aricept, uh, was launched by ASI back in 1997. So they have a long history of Alzheimer's disease research and being able to take Alzheimer's disease drugs to market. We've actually executed two licensing agreements with ASI. So the first of which was a um, which was an agreement we entered into in August 2019. Uh, in respect of Japan only. In October of 2020, um, about eight months ago, we entered into a global agreement. Um, and mainly I'm gonna focus on that global agreement as we talk through today's presentation. Um, that's a 10 year agreement um, uh, that we've entered into in, in terms of that global agreement. Um, the terms of that were that we received from ASI a $15 million upfront payment. Um, that was received in the in the December half year period. Um, and then going forward, we will receive from ASI a low double digit royalty on all revenue that's generated uh, from the sale of Cogstate technology. That royalty will not be less than $30 million over the course of the next uh, 10 years. And you can see on the slide there in the top right, we've separated that out. So that, that minimum will be $10 million over years one to five, and then $20 million over years six to 10. Cogstate um, will receive that royalty um, and not need to fund any commercialization activities. All of that will be funded by ASI. ASI will also fund um, any of the, develop, Cog, the technology development work that Cogstate needs to undertake to improve our product, and they'll manage all regulatory submissions. All of the data that's generated um, uh, through the sale of Cogstate technology um, by ASI will be jointly owned by um, Cogstate and ASI. At the end of the 10-year license, all assets revert to Cogstate, and Cogstate continues to own all IP. So, the context for this is that ASI and their development partner, Biogen, have recently received approval from the FDA in the United States um, for sale and marketing of the first ever disease modifying drug of Alzheimer's disease. It's called Adjuhelm, and it's shown on the picture here. So that approval, accelerated approval, was received on the 7th of June uh, this year, so only a few weeks ago. The other really important thing to understand here is there's other drugs um, also um, coming through that we expect to hit the market actually relatively soon. And so also in June, um, the FDA granted breakthrough therapy designation for another drug that's been developed by ASI and Biogen called Lacanumab, um, and then a drug that's been developed by Eli Lilly called Denenumab. Um, Eli Lilly have stated publicly that they intend to lodge their biologic license application or the application for their new drug uh, in respect of Denenumab uh, late, later in this calendar year. 
Um, they doubled down on that on their earnings call yesterday, Lily's earnings call, um, again, reinforced the fact that they expected to lodge that uh, biologic license application this year. So what that means is we, we have one drug on market for Alzheimer's disease now, um, but we expect to see more drugs coming onto market within the next 12 to 24 months. And so that changes the commercial opportunity for our business. And in two ways does it change that. So firstly, we expect to see a significant increase in the level of R&D spend in Alzheimer's disease over the coming years. Um, and, and we see that's consistent with what we've seen in other indications. So if you look at multiple sclerosis for, as an example, you see back, back in 1993, the first uh, approval of interferon beta um, treatments was, was approved um, for multiple sclerosis. And what you saw after that was an increase in R&D spend um, associated with MS, along with a, then a very fairly steady um, release of new and better therapy options for patients over the coming years. We, and you've seen that across a range of different indications, and we expect um, that that is what you'll see in Alzheimer's disease also. And so we expect that that will benefit our clinical trials business. Um, we also um, expect though, that, that that will underpin demand for cognitive assessment in the healthcare part of our business. So as Alzheimer's disease drugs are released, we expect people to go to their doctor and say, I'm worried about my memory. And the question is, what does the doctor do at that stage? And that's where our technology can play a role um, through the relationship we've established, the commercial relationship we've established with ASI as they um, commercialize our technology. The other really interesting thing that's happening within our market um, is a move to more virtual or what they refer to as decentralized clinical trials. That was a trend that was occurring prior to COVID, but it's really gathered, um, gathered momentum, momentum through COVID because of the obvious advantages of not having to get everybody into a centralized uh, clinical trial site and to be able to do things from home um, for all of the obvious reasons there's significant advantage with respect to digital native assessments in the context of remote or home-based assessment. And we expect to benefit from that. I'm gonna turn now attention to the, um, our financial results for the year ending 30 June, 2021. Um, so we've released preliminary results. Our uh, full audited results will be released on the uh, 25th of August. So just later this month. When we sell to a pharmaceutical company, we sign a, a sales contract and that sales contract to turn, you know, will, will outline the value, both in terms of technology and services um, that, uh, that Cogstate will generate in terms of revenue. And that revenue will roll off over a period of time. But our lead indicator is the value of sales contracts. What we're showing here is that $47 million of sales contracts executed for the year to 30 June 21, up 15% on the prior year. Alzheimer's disease is an important mix, an important component of that, um, of that mix, and that represented 65% of total contracts signed uh, in fiscal 21. If we then look at the, the, the um, our revenue backlog or the amount of revenue we expect to generate going forward based on those contracts that are in place. We see we're at over 101.5 million dollars worth of uh, contracts in place uh, that will generate revenue uh, going forward. So that's up a, over more than 150% compared to the last year. Um, that's broken down to 58.4 million of that is clinical trials revenue and, and 43 million of that being healthcare revenue. And that healthcare revenue is the minimum uh, amounts that ASI must pay to Cogstate over the course of the license. Um, the chart here shows you know, what that revenue roll off looks like over time. Um, and what you can see there is a, you know, a substantial amount of uh, revenue locked in um, for financial year uh, 22. Um, and similarly, you know, um, and what's really encouraging is more than $25 million worth of revenue locked in for financial year 23 already. People then usually ask me, well, what does that mean in terms of, you know, given um, the strong position you have uh, with respect to revenue locked in for fiscal 22, what does that mean? What can we expect? So what we're showing here is really historically, what has total revenue looked like, um, you know, as um, relative to the revenue that we had in place at the beginning of the period? 
And what we're saying is that over the last um, number of years, uh, the, the amount of revenue we had locked in at the start of the year ended up being 52% of what we ended up with. So to, to give a practical example, for financial year 21, we started the year with $15.4 million of the revenue um, secured by contract. And then that ended up being 54% of our actual clinical trials revenue, which is 28.7 million. And so if we look forward to next fiscal year, um, we start the year with $24.5 million with the clinical trials revenue contracted uh, for the period. That's up almost 60% on the prior year. So we're looking at really strong revenue growth again um, in relation to financial year 22. Revenue for 21 was up 44% compared to the compared to the prior year. Um, so we've seen really strong revenue growth uh, quarter on quarter, half on half, and year on year, um, uh, which you know, which is really encouraging. With that 44% revenue growth, or around in rough terms about $10 million worth of revenue growth um, from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21, we've actually seen really good financial leverage. So we've provided an a, a earnings range of profit before tax between $5.2 and $5.7 million. That does include a one-off. Um, so when you renormalize that, um, we, we're talking about um, uh, estimated profit um, in, in the range of uh, 2.8 to um, $3.3 .3 million um, for the year. Um, and really strong second half performance. So from that $10 million worth of revenue um, increase we saw in fiscal 21, we've actually generated about $5 million of profit increase. So as I said, really good leverage, really stable cost base through the business. The business was cash flow positive um, in financial year 21. Um, so cash inflow uh, from operations of $16.8 million for the year. That does include that one-off payment um, from ASI as part of that um, as part of that licensing agreement. But again, if we normalize that, if we exclude that, still a strong cash flow performance from Cogstate for um, and, and, and a, a cash operating uh, inflow for the year. Uh, and we expect that those cash inflows will increase as our revenues increase into financial years 22 and financial years 23. So to come back to this, um, this investment thesis around Cogstate, as I said before, we have, we've delivered really strong revenue growth um, in financial year 21. That revenue growth, given the leverage that we have in the business has delivered really strong profit growth uh, through the year. The business was cash flow positive through the year. We look at forward to fiscal year 22 and 23 with a high degree of contracted revenue in place. And we expect to be able to deliver sort of similar levels of revenue growth from 22 to 23. And that will uh, also provide increases in profitability through the year. We're seeing this, um, the macro trends, both in terms of increase R&D and Alzheimer's disease, increased demand from cognitive assessment for cognitive assessment based around the, the approval of the first Alzheimer's disease therapies, um, as well as the move um, to remote assessment, which favors digital native um, uh, tools um, as really strong drivers um, of continued growth in our business. Our Technology is really well validated commercially and scientifically over 500 peer reviewed publications supporting the validity of our technology. Uh, we've been building this business for 20 years around this investment thesis of we have an increasing um, age demographic, increasing incidence of Alzheimer's disease and that there's going to be a need um, for digital cognitive assessments to act as low cost, non-invasive screening tools. Um, we have now to a position where the market opportunity is presenting itself because of the release of these new therapies. And we believe that Cogstate is going to be able to deliver really strong um, revenue and earnings growth into coming periods. So with that, Mark, I'll, I'll pause and open up for questions. Cheers, thanks, Brad. We have one here currently from the audience. Let's tackle that and then uh, we'll tackle a few others. Uh, if a competing drug to uh, Adulam 
you know, you've got Donimab by Lilly gets approved and shows yep. higher e efficacy. Would a size mm -hmm. commercial efforts related to CG, to CogSafe technology be dampened uh, or encouraged? I don't think so. I mean, so you, I think that question comes back to a size commitment broadly to Alzheimer's disease. So ASI is committed to a you know, really developing a dementia ecosystem, which you know, includes cognitive and test assessments like Cogstate, includes um, uh, blood-based biomarkers, includes a range of therapy options, both, um, both disease modifying and symptomatic options. Um, so they are really committed to this space. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think that they're committed to rolling out our technology um, regardless of the success of Aduhelb. Um, and I think, you know, um, you only need to look at their, um, their statements in re respect of their own drug that's coming through Lacanumab um, and understand where they, they view that relative to, um, to both uh, the, the approved drug, Aduhelm, as well as Eli Lilly's Denenumab. So, um, so a, a range of shops on goals from ASI really committed to this space. And what we've seen is a, is a really committed partner who are pushing ahead aggressively with the commercialization plans for the Cogstate technology. Great. Let's, we've kind of got two questions on a similar vein, so let's uh, tackle these. Uh, I think it's around, mm -hmm. uh, just for um, setting the scene, the controversy around uh, the, the currently approved drug, Adulam. Mm -hmm. um, is there any risk the FDA would reverse their prior approval? Um, and if so, you know, what if they did, what would that then do in terms of the commercial agreement with ASI? Um, you know, wouldn't an official approval in yeah. another jurisdiction in Europe, for example, you know, help cement the certainty of the ASI partnership where, you know, we can't go live in the US, but, you know, we can work on the drug in, uh, in terms of supplying the European market, given ASI's mm -hmm. kind of global reach in terms of their business? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, good question. So, so look, firstly, let, let me deal with the issue of, you know, is there any risk to the termination of the ASI Cog State commercial arrangement? And the answer to that is no. Um, so there's no, um, the, the ASI doesn't have the ability to terminate uh, the agreement based on um, approval or non-approval of, of a therapeutic option. So that's not linked in any way to that. Um, so I don't think there's any risk of that. Is there risk that the the regulator in the United, the United States um, walks back the approval of Aduhelm? Um, we don't believe that to be the case. Um, our expectation, in fact, is that, um, you know, as stated on Eli Lilly's earnings call yesterday, um, they will seek, similar to Aduhelm, accelerated approval for their drug, Denenumab, uh, later this year. So we actually think the reverse, that the not that the risk is that um, Aduhelm is removed from market, but uh, that it's more likely that you will see at least two and potentially three drugs on market in the short term. Okay, great. And then another one that was emailed in uh, ahead of time. Uh, and again, I think it's somebody who knows the space uh, very well. Uh, mm -hmm. ASI's uh, investment into Altoide, uh, a producer of a registered medical device similar to Cognigram. Um, the question is, is ASI, you know, how much of a hedging their bets are they doing by, you know, mm -hmm. working with, with these guys mm -hmm. and working with Cogstate? Yes, good question. Um, so the first thing to draw out there is that, um, that the, the product from Altoide is really not um, similar to Cog State's assessment in any way. So what Altoida is working on is a virtual reality assessment of um, activities of daily living, right? So when we, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease and, and measuring uh, drug impact, um, cognition is one uh, aspect that, that needs to be measured. Another aspect is what they call activities of daily living. So the, the ability of people to, you know, make food for themselves to get themselves organized to get themselves dressed to these kind these kind of general daily activities what Altoida is is, uh, is working on is a virtual reality assessment 
of those activities of daily living. It's really quite different um, to what Cog State is doing in terms of developing a you know, low cost, non-invasive screening tool for cognition to be used within a primary care setting. So I think it's important to understand the differences there. Um, and I think it's completely appropriate that ASI would be investing um, in things like that, um, you know, like a virtual reality assessment of, of activities of daily living. Now, will, will that be successful or not in terms of, you know, will that be a useful tool? I think it's really early to say. I mean, Altoid is a very early stage company. Um, you know, so again, to give some reference points here, so Cogstate has more than 500 peer reviewed publications of our technology. Altoid at the moment has five. Um, so the very early stage um, in terms of development of that technology it does involve utilization of virtual reality. And I think there's some issues with respect to, you know, um, elderly population um, accepting virtual reality assessments. So I think there's some, you know, there's, so there's some bars to jump there. That said, I think it's, you know, as I said, it's completely appropriate that ASI as part of their investment across you know, a whole dementia ecosystem would be looking at um, a number of different assessments. And so I don't think it's any more uh, controversial than ASI investing in digital, uh, sorry, in, sorry, blood-based biomarkers that they would invest in these kind of activities. And in fact, I think it's highly appropriate and highly encouraging of their general investment in the space. Okay, great. And then in terms of the next six to 12 months, uh, is the key thing to be work, looking at, I think, in the broader space, uh, Lily's drug approval, um, or is it, or is it more what the FDA might do around a, a doulum? So I think there's a number of different, um, you know, sort of uh, data points, if you like, to to monitor. I think the first thing to look at is the general level of R and D in the Alzheimer's disease space. Um, so I would be, you know, uh, that's one of the things that we're more focused on perhaps than um, uh, some of those other factors. Yeah, so things like, so data points like the um, Bristol Myers Squibb um, getting back into um, Alzheimer's disease R&D after walking away from all neuroscience development about 10 years ago. So the in licensing by them of new Alzheimer's disease therapeutics is, you know, is just one of those public indicators of that increase in R&D spend. Um, I think monitoring what Eli Lilly is doing with denenumab as well as what ASI and Biogen are doing with lecanemab um, also gives investors additional insight. Um, you know, I would point people to Eli Lilly's earnings call from yesterday, as well as um, the comments that have been made in the last sort of 48 hours from uh, out, out of ASI, um, in, in particularly Ivan Chung, who runs the US business with respect to their plan for lecanemab. Um, I think you can get a lot of uh, insight in relation to um, intentions from those companies to get those drugs on market relatively quickly from, from those kind of um, things. Um, and then, you know, also, you know, over the course of the coming um, months um, in, in the short term, Cog, we'll, we'll have public launch of, uh, of Cog State's digital technologies within the United States. And I think that will give investors additional data points and additional um, visibility as to um, marketing plans and other things. Okay, great. If we don't have any further questions from the audience and I don't see any coming through, but I'll give it a I'll give it a second or two there. Um, no, it doesn't look like any further. Brad, we're just about up on time. I think we've, we've um, scraped in with a minute to spare. Uh, thank you Excellent. very much for, for coming back in and, and giving us an update on, on all things Cog State. And uh, yeah, we had a, quite a few kind of technical questions, I would say. So if anybody has any further questions, Brad's contact details uh, have been up there and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any further questions if there are any. Thanks, Mark. Really appreciate the time. Cheers. Thanks, Brad. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll leave it there and I wish everybody a good rest of their Thursday.